Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for attending this evening to our community meeting, Open House. On um, behalf of the California High Speed Rail Authority, I would like to welcome you um, to hear a presentation and receive information on the Palmdale to Burbank project section of the California High Speed Rail Authority system. Thank you very much. Um, tonight's meeting is one in a series of meetings that we are conducting throughout the community area so that folks receive the latest information on this very important program. Um, if you are keeping track, um, this high-speed rail program has been in the planning stages for quite some time. Uh, ten years ago was when it was voter approved, and since then the team that you have, um, will be interacting with today um, has been working to do the planning and bringing forward the alternatives uh, recommended for uh, this part of the state system. You'll get lots of information about it, but we welcome you very much for being with us here tonight and receiving the latest information on the project. Before I begin, if I can ask for a show of hands of those of you in the audience who are here for the first time for a high-speed rail meeting. Can you raise your hand, please? Excellent, it looks like about half of the room. And those of you online, if you are with us for the first time, thank you for joining us. Um, it's really important to receive the latest project information as this um, transformative transportation program proceeds. It's quite large, there's a lot of moving parts and information, but it's very important to receive the latest and really receive what is accurately the next steps and what you can expect. Um, I would like to point out, uh, you might want to have handy with you the project fact sheet that you received when you walked in. And those of you who are online, this will be available to you as well on the website. The project map on the first panel is a very good reference for you to kind of just have with you as they walk through the project information. I would also like to point out for those of you in the room that you also received a yellow card. It's a speaker card. After the presentation, we would welcome your questions about the project. Um, if you could just fill out the card and kind of just wave it while we're presenting, the staff around the room will collect it and then we'll be taking as many of the questions as we can um, by our panel here. Okay, um, with that, what I would like to do is introduce our panel to you, our presenters. First, our regional director, Michelle Baim. She is our Southern California director for the High Speed Rail program here in Southern California. Following Michelle will be Juan Carlos Velasquez, who is the project manager for the Palmdale to Burbank section, and will be giving you a little bit more detail on the section. And then finally, Scott Steinworth. Scott Steinwert will be providing the environmental information. And together the panel will be available to answer your questions, those of you here in the room and as well those of you online. So with that, I would like to introduce to you Michelle Bain. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah Veva. And again, I would like to thank everybody who's uh, taken time out of their day, out of their busy week to come join the meeting. Uh, these are really valuable opportunities for us to share with you what we know about this project, where we are at in the planning process, and what you can expect as we move forward. Your input with regards to your community is invaluable to us as we conduct the route selection process for the high-speed rail project. As Henaveva mentioned, this is a large statewide project and understanding your community and the features within your community that define its character are really important to us as we plan the route, although route planning is very difficult. And so again, we appreciate your participation and the conversation that we've had uh, with those of you who have attended our meetings in the past and the conversation that we will start with those of you who are attending a meeting for the first time. So with that, you can see here our agenda tonight. We are going to talk a little bit about the statewide program. It did look like about half of you were new to high-speed rail meetings, so we'll spend a little bit of extra time there. Uh, those of you who've been with us 
before, please bear with us. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the process and the conversations that we have as we work towards route selection, and then we will get into the good stuff and tell you specifically about this Palmdale to Burbank section. It is one of the most complex sections in the entire plan project, and we're doing a lot of things here that are deploying sort of worldwide technology and applying that here in the United States, like for instance, the tunneling that we're proposing and some other things like that. So we wanna share that with you. And then we will talk to you about that route selection process and let you know what our next steps are. So on this slide here, you can see the 800 mile all electric high speed rail project that is planned for the state of California. In the navy blue, that is our phase one section that we are working on right now. That is the direct transportation corridor connection between San Francisco and Los Angeles, our two most highly urbanized areas here in the state of California. I'd like to emphasize again that this is an electric high-speed train. So this is a major north-south corridor that we're introducing into the state of California that is renewable energy based. Um, these trains and these types of systems can handle a very large volume of people uh, moving back and forth, and so this is meant to complement the other transportation systems that we have operating in the state today. If you look closely at the map, you can see some little white dots, and you can see the city names there. Those are the cities where we are planning a station. Uh, and also in your mind's eye, if you think about where in the state of California people are living today and you created a map where the red and you colored the map so where it was colored red, that would be where we had the most people or the densest uh, communities. And if you put this map on top of that, this map perfectly matches where people are living in the state of California right now. Of course, we do have some folks and there are some dense, uh, dense pockets along the coast, but generally this route follows and connects where the majority of the population in the state of California is living. Sometimes down here in Southern California, it's easy to lose track of the fact that cities like Bakersfield and Fresno are among the top 10 by population in the state of California. And then of course, we've got cities like Anaheim, also top 10, San Diego, uh, San Francisco, et cetera. So this renewable energy transportation corridor is really being designed to connect the communities and the majority of the folks within the state of California. And um, it's been a minute, frankly, since we started working on this project. And I will say that when we started giving these presentations a few years ago, uh, we had about 38 million people living here, and today we have close to 40 million people. So that population is going to continue to grow. It will be 50 million by the middle of this century. And the other thing about California is we have a lot of visitors. There's something along the lines of 200 million people visit the state of California, somewhere in California, every year, and these are typically people that want to travel around the state and really be able to appreciate some of the things that we have, both the cities and the natural wonder. So those are the things that we're thinking about when we're thinking about planning high speed is something that can help us to move those folks around the state in a more efficient way than they're moving today. And what are we doing? So this is a big project. As you know, it takes some time to bring it to fruition. And so we set priorities for the agency and we work towards them. Right now, our priority number one front and center is get a high-speed electric train operating in California. Many of us can't picture how a high-speed train would be different or provide a different type of service than some of the offerings that we have today, like Metrolink and Amtrak. 
And those are great trains, and we are planning in coordination with them so that our service complements the service that they're offering, but they're very different. They don't travel between two points at the speed that our train travels, and so they don't offer that different type of travel experience, different type of investment in terms of time to get from point A to point B. So we want to get those trains operating so people can begin to see them and understand the advantages. We want to complete the route selection for the entire phase one. That entire navy blue section, San Francisco down to Anaheim, we want to get that route selection completed so we as a state and you as communities know where we're planning to build this train. That's really important because then we can begin to start planning the construction of it. We have some of this under construction now, and I'll talk to you about that in a, in a minute. Uh, but this is an important step that we take because once the route is selected, we can begin to get more specific with the cost estimates to build it, get much, much uh, more close in terms of the ranges that we, intend, uh, we believe and the cost that of the project. And we can also begin to get the private sector and other elements interested in the building of this project. But that step, getting route selection and environmental clearance, is very, very important to us as we move forward. It unlocks a lot of opportunities for us. We also want people to be able to see what we're doing. We want to be able to put up signs and we want to say high-speed rail dollars being spent here creating jobs to build this project. And there are a couple of key projects in Southern California where we are planning to do that. Uh, one of them is the rosecrans Marquart grade separation project, which is a little bit south of where we are today, and that is an at-grade crossing of the rail corridor right now where a bridge would be built to take vehicles over it rather than across it in front of trains. That is a huge safety improvement, and when that is uh, underway, we will also be able to complete some additional track work down there, which allows us to immediately operate more Metrolink trains than we are today. We can unlock about 30 more Metrolink trains, provide more service basically throughout the Metrolink uh, service area here in Southern California by completing that project. The second one is the modernization of LA Union Station. Marvelous old station. It's been upgraded, obviously, now the subway goes there. We've got light rail there. We want to bring high-speed rail into Union Station as well. And the modernization there means that we're taking the tracks that right now dead end at the 101, and we're taking them across the 101 and connecting them back into the railroad corridor. So all trains traveling through that corridor can go through Union Station much faster than they do today. It's connected to that rosecrans Marquardt project. If we can run 30 more trains, we want to run those trains through Union Station faster than they run today. So immediately, by investing these dollars, we're Im improving how the Metrolink service operates in Southern California, and we're setting the stage for high-speed rail trains to pull into Union Station and to travel under that bridge at uh, Rosecrans Marquardt. And finally, we want to begin service on the entire phase one. Now it's going to take a little while, but we plan to get service operating from San Francisco all the way down to Anaheim now in 2033. And that's important because that is going to take a lot of effort. We do have construction going on. I mentioned that. Uh, these are pictures from our construction site in the Central Valley. That's where we are currently actively building this project. We have 21 active construction sites up there, and that has contributed to the creation of 2,000 jobs to help build the high-speed rail project. Um, so that's very important when you're looking at infrastructure like high-speed rail. There are a lot, there's a lot of work that goes into bringing this project to fruition. Um, and so we are excited about those jobs, certainly. 
And this is a slide, of course, those of you who've been to these meetings before are familiar with it. Um, I'll walk you through it again. As we're doing route selection, we are seeking a balance. We have some things that we need to consider and they don't all fit easily into the same bucket. And so we've got to look at these things, we've got to evaluate these things, and we've got to figure out how to balance these to get to a best possible uh, route. And the first one is the project objectives. Of course, we are basically planning to build a major renewable energy-based corridor north-south across the state of California. We have to be able to get those trains back and forth across the corridor quickly. That's the promise of an express train service. And so doing that and designing it safely are things that are of utmost importance. Over on the other side, down at the bottom, you have the environmental resources. Again, California is a great place. We've got mountains, we've got trees, we've got animals, we've got all waters, uh, we've got communities, which I'll talk about, of course, up at the top. And so we need to be able to protect those when we're building a major infrastructure project like a high-speed rail uh, line. And so we work with regulatory agencies in our work to identify the, um, the natural resources that need to be protected and identify the ways that we protect them. And then, of course, at the top, it's the community. And these meetings are a very valuable way that we can get the understanding of the character of the community. And the feedback that we get has a very real impact on the project that we develop. That doesn't mean that that project has all of the features that everybody might expect at any given location because it's a balance of all of those things. It is not necessarily going to be um, all about the environmental resources. It's not going to be all about the project objectives, right? It's going to balance all of those considerations. And so we've been working on that balance for quite some time, and we're here today to talk to you a little bit about it and what we know. But we still continue to work on this project and get feedback from you that helps us to make it better. So in order to do that, of course, we go out and talk to people. We talk to a lot of people. We talk to people in meetings like this. We go out, we talk to people at their homes. Uh, we talk to people on the phone. We respond to people who write us letters. And that's how we get this information and understand the community, um, look, un you know, look under and, and find things that we maybe didn't know or couldn't understand just by doing a Google desktop study, that type of thing. And so those things go into this balance that we seek uh, to strike on the project. And when we do this, when we do research and analyze the project, when we work with the environmental regulatory agencies, and when we gather public uh, feedback and impact, we have over time been refining the routes and changing them. And again, seeking that balance. And so you can see here from 2010 to 2016, those routes have changed. And it's because of this feedback and this process. The routes that we are studying in 2016 on balance are much better routes, much less impactful than the routes that we were studying in 2010. Again, that doesn't mean that that feels like that at every cross street, but on balance for that 38 miles, that route has less impacts today than it did when we got started. And so those three routes are shown here on the map. Let me orient you a little bit. In purple, that's where these routes are in tunnel or underground. In green, that's where these routes would run at grade. And in blue, that's where these routes have bridges or they're going over something. And so for the last couple of years, we've been studying three alternatives, the refined SR14, E1, and E2. And 
you can see there the range in length and you can see there the range in tunnels. Of course, we are trying to connect Palmdale, right, the Antelope Valley and the San Fernando Valley. And there's a mountain range in between those two locations. And so we are proposing to tunnel underneath the mountains. That's what they do all around the world when they're building and planning these types of projects. So that's what we are going to uh, employ as the key idea to come up with the route here. This changes really um, the amount of time and the connectivity between those two locations. Um, on this map, I think you can see the black line that is that goes up and down. That is the current Metrolink line. That line's about 58 miles long for your reference. Again, our route's up to 38 miles long. So when you're talking about getting on a trip and traveling between those two points, you now have a 20 minute trip where today in traffic on the 14, you may have a two hour trip. And so those are the types of things and changes that a system like this can bring. Um, and then our job is to figure out the best way to bring this system and then to get people talking about what kind of opportunities that might unlock for them. So with that, I'll bring Juan Carlos Velasquez up and he'll talk to you a little bit about each of the specific locations. Okay, so um, I'm just going to walk through the alignment um, alt alternatives that we've been studying uh, kind of from north to south and just point out some of the differences and, um, and the characteristics of those alignments. So starting in Palmdale and the Antelope Valley, we're generally um, running along the existing Metrolink that's there in Palmdale. It goes all the way up to Lancaster. Uh, so we're running parallel um, you know, right next to those tracks. Um, we will have our station in Palmdale. Um, at the Palmdale station, it's, uh, right now they have a, um, it's, it's called the Pan Palmdale Transportation Center. All their buses go there. The Metrolink is there. And also the train to Las Vegas, uh, the projects that are planning the, that connection will terminate in Palmdale. And we've designed our um, station there that would be able to um, connect to that train um, in that location. And moving south along there, we will stay on the ground. We'll cross the San Andreas Fault just we start, before we start getting into some hills and mountains in the Acton area. Um, so south of Palmdale, you'll see the, the line is green, and then it splits into two, um, the refined SR-14 on, on the north side, and then the E1, E2 on the south side. Uh, so um, as we go along, um, sort of in the middle, near Acton and Agua Dulce area, and into Santa Clarita, you see the refined SR-14 generally follows the 14 freeway, but you can see the 14 freeway is that uh, sort of brown squiggly line. It, it doesn't follow it exactly. Um, we're much straighter than that. Um, so we're t basically tunneling and going uh, um, through short tunnels and bridges as we go through that pass uh, from Acton to Santa Clarita. Um, we will uh, cross the Pacific Coast Trail and near um, the Vasquez um, Rocks, but we'll be on the south side of the, the 14, so we won't have any impacts to that facility. Uh, with the E1-E2 line um, in Acton, we will run alongside this uh, substation, electrical substation, where um, Edison and other, a lot of uh, energy comes in and, and um, is distributed from that location in Acton. With E1-E2, we'll run alongside there and then go into the long tunnels uh, through the mountains, uh, eventually get into the San Fernando Valley. Um, when we're in the uh, forest, we're all in tunnel um, because it's all mountains, so we, we will be tunneling through all of that area. With the refined SR-14, we will be um, near where um, there's an existing gravel mine near um, Soledad Canyon and Lang Station, just to the uh, east of Santa Clarita. Uh, that's where we would cross from the 14 area, go over the river, and then go into a tunnel and then tunnel through underneath the mountains, the San Gabriel Mountains, um, until we reach uh, the Pacoima area. So that's the, the, the characteristics of the 14. We do have um, um, a, one good benefit about this, 
this particular alignment at the north end is there is a existing gravel mine that is um, uh, near the 14 freeway where our tunnel would start. Um, it, it's in the San Gabriel Mountains National Monument. It's in the Angeles National Forest now. And what we would plan to do is use that as our construction site. And then as we tunnel all the material that comes out of there, we'll restore that area back to um, more natural conditions, you know, fill up the old mine that was there. So that's a potential benefit that the project would have with that route. Um, with the E1 and E2, as I mentioned, entirely underground through the mountains. Um, we are um, looking at a potentially including one intermediate access point. Basically, it's a, um, a um, one um, whole a, a kind of a side uh, opening. Oh, is it too close? Sorry. Okay. Okay. I was. Okay. No, no, thank you. I, did, I was not aware that I was too close. Was it too close? Okay, I'll, I'll be further away. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, so as I was saying, uh, there would be one potential um, intermediate access point to, um, um, uh, for a, to, to uh, insert a tunnel boring machine um, down into the tunnel to launch from there. So that, that is uh, one other aspect of those tunnels. In the San Fernando Valley area here, um, again, we have the E1 joins the refined SR14 uh, at, uh, with, under, uh, with the tunnels. And then um, as it comes uh, uh, near uh, Branford Street, that's where it would emerge from the tunnel and then join the existing rail corridor. So we would want to be um, along the uh, parallel to the existing Metrolink tracks that are there all the way through um, that section. And then we would eventually get to Burbank in that route with the E2. Um, we emerge from the tunnels near uh, Tonga Wash. We cross over the wash, over the 210 freeway, um, back into tunnel um, near the Shadow Hills area, and then join back into, um, get back into the Burbank station. And then eventually all of the routes, uh, the, the routes con converge and they would all join and be at one location with the Burbank station, um, which would be at the airport um, and it would be in an underground configuration uh, due to the airport um, facility there. There are other features of the high speed rail system um, that we wanted to just touch on. Um, you know, there is the tunneling and all of that. Um, there, it is an electric train, so we do have um, electric substations that would provide power to the train. Um, one would be at the north end um, near Acton, where the substation is now, and then one would be on the south end near where the uh, DWP uh, facility is now. That's where they would draw power. Um, there's, there would be overhead um, wires, sort of similar to the uh, metro light rails that you see where you have um, the electric light rail trains get power from those overhead wires. That's the, the type of system that would power our train. Um, we also would have uh, maintenance facilities. Uh, we would have um, communication towers and um, a, a lot of safety um, uh, equipment or, or uh, features. One, we'd have an entirely sealed corridor um, that would be all fenced um, and we'd have intrusion uh, protection, detection rather, that would detect any um, intrusion into our rail corridor, uh, unlike the rail corridors now where you can walk on. Ours would be entirely sealed. Um, and we also would have positive train control system, which is an automated train control system that would override uh, if there was an operator error um, to ensure safety of the passengers. Um, so Scott will um, go through our environmental process, and Scott, don't stand so close to the mic. <laughs> Thank you, Juan Carlos. Hi, everybody. I'm Scott Steinward. I'm leading the environmental analysis for the project. Talk a little bit about the environmental process. It is a process. It's a, a process that's uh, stipulated by federal and state laws, and it has many steps and many milestones in this diagram shows that process. You read it from on the top left to right and then again left to right on the bottom. Uh, we, there's a blue arrow that shows where we are in that process. It started with scoping many years ago and scoping is when we look at a wide range of alternatives and ideas and as Michelle talked about we work those down and to narrow them down refine them into a set of alternatives that we are now studying in great detail. That's the information you see around the room tonight. 
We're at a point where the staff is making a recommendation as to which of those alternatives we're studying now uh, is their preferred alternative. And then once that is, um, is going to go to the board, the uh, High Speed Rail Authority Board in November, and they'll uh, consider the staff's recommendation, decide whether they'll concur or decide one of the other alternatives is uh, preferred or uh, no preferred alternative at this point in time. We still continue on the process. We're going to then prepare a draft environmental document. That'll be issued to the public to review. That'll happen about a year from now. Uh, that'll be distributed widely. Everybody gets a chance to review it, provide their written comments to us. We then take those comments, we respond to them, revise our analyses, do what we need to to address those comments, and then we prepare a final environmental document that includes those, uh, your comments as well as the responses to those. And then that is taken to the High Speed Rail Authority Board. And at that point, then they decide what their ultimate decision is going to be in terms of what to do in terms of this project section. This slide just shows the list of all the different topics we study as part of the environmental process. It's a huge list from A to we always A to T and everything in between. Uh, and for each of these, we study in great detail. We um, were out in the community taking, uh, doing surveys, um, measuring the noise. Uh, we're doing surveys in the mountains for biological resources. So a lot of work's gone on over the last couple of years to collect this information and analyze the alternatives that are, are depicted here in the room tonight. We don't just, as part of our analysis, we are trying to identify what the impacts of the alternatives are, but we don't just stop there. We uh, at that point, it's really an iterative process with the engineers. So if we identify impacts from an alternative, we work with them to, uh, as this slide says, either avoid alternatives. That would be to, can we redesign, do something in terms of where the rail alignment is or facilities to avoid impacting this resource, whatever it might be. If we can't do that, can we minimize that impact, make ourselves smaller, the design smaller to reduce the amount of impact? And then at the end, if we can't avoid it, uh, and we minimize as much as we can, but we still have some effect, we mitigate, which means we replace it. And we try to replace it as close to where the impact happens as we can. Um, this process really does involve you all. Uh, the input we get from the community and from these meetings and from other meetings, as Michelle said, we have a lot of uh, interaction with the stakeholders along this corridor. That's really important to our analysis to understand what is important to the community. Uh, you guys know your communities better than we will ever know them. And so that information has been very valuable for us to identify the important resources in the communities and work with the engineering team to try to avoid and reduce uh, and mitigate where we, where we can. Um, this talks to just about kind of some of the steps in the process here uh, that I went over in terms of uh, draft documents receiving um, uh, feedback from you all. One of the things I want to do highlight is some people ask about why are we doing a, a preferred alternative at this point since there's a draft and final we're so far from the end. This has been added to uh, federal law for, and is a recommendation to all agencies now to identify early as possible in the process this, the, recommend, the, the preferred alternative. Uh, as early as you can so that when we, the draft environmental document comes out and you review it and provide comments, you know where, what the agency's thinking. And so that helps in your ability to comment. If you concur with the selection, great, you can say that. If you don't, it helps the reviewers and commenters explain better why they think another alternative would be better or doing something different would be better. It's easier and more beneficial for you to know where the agency's heading when you're reviewing a document like this. So the, uh, this slide gives a summary of what the staff's recommended alternative is at this point, which is the refined SR14 alternative. It gives the stats on this, which much, much of this uh, Juan Carlos went over and Michelle did. It's 38 miles long from Palmdale down to Burbank. Uh, there are uh, six board tunnels uh, on, the, on this alignment. It starts in the multimodal station in, in Palmdale, as Juan Carlos mentioned, uh, with the Palmdale Transit Center. All that would be combined in one location in Palmdale. It uses the met existing Metrolink right away where it can. It crosses the San Andreas Fault at grade. Uh, it bridges over SR14, that freeway at Red Rover Mine interchange. It also bridges over the Santa Clara River, avoiding impacts to that river. It tunnels underneath the San Gabriel Mountains National Monument, mouthful, uh, as well as the Angeles National Forest. And it tunnels all the way into uh, the San Fernando Valley, um, just here, just into Pacoima, where it emerges uh, at Branford Street in an industrial area. And then it heads 
primarily on the surface towards the uh, Burbank station where then it goes again underground to an underground Burbank station. That will turn it back over to Michelle. Thank you, Scott. And based on the uh, research that we've done to date and what we've learned from communities, here are some of the reasons why we are recommending the refined alternative as the preferred alternative. And please understand, we're recommending this based on what we know today about this alternative. That can change over time, but we have done quite a bit of research. You know, we have checked the rock. Um, our rock box is in the back if you want to go take a look at some of the rock that we've looked at. Uh, we've done a lot of analysis of uh, uh, gone out and, and looked at plants and animals and rivers and all kinds of things. We've gone and walked in communities and based on what we know today, we believe the refined SR 14 or the refined alternative is the alternative that rises to the top and strikes that balance. And it's because it's the easiest and fastest to construct. It has the lowest risk during construction. We have the lowest risk of any unexpected conditions. It has fewer traffic and air quality impacts within the communities that surround it. That was very important. Uh, and it would generate the least amount of spoils of the three alternatives. Uh, it has the shortest tunnel under the Angeles National Forest and the monument. That was important. We wanted to be able to go under that for the shortest possible distance uh, that we could. There is the least amount of water in that particular location in the mountain area that we studied. Um, that is good. It avoids archaeological and tribal resources, and we are reusing a mine site. And in fact, we're looking at reuses in the San Fernando Valley as well as a tunnel portal so that we can go into a place that's already disturbed in the wilderness. We can use that to construct our project, and when we're done, we can turn it back to a natural state. And so our next steps, of course, we're holding these meetings. Uh, we're here tonight on the 26th. We have two more meetings. Uh, so we would encourage folks to attend or you to encourage folks to go on the website and watch this webcast. This meeting will be available on our online for people to learn more about the project. And again, just to go over the steps, to capture the steps, we know it's a process um, when we are, are trying to select a route and complete the environmental clearance. Uh, for the last two years, we've been studying the three alternatives we talked about today. We now have gained enough understanding of those to recommend the refined alternative as the alternative we will also present to our board and let them know this is what we're re recommending moving forward with in terms of the route. Our board will then provide us direction in terms of moving forward. They could agree. They could give us additional direction on things to study and to move forward with the release of the environmental document. Uh, we plan to release those in over a year, the draft documents. There's an extensive review process and comment process with those, and then we would finalize. We would take all of those comments in. We would finalize those documents and take them to the board for certification in January of 2021. So we have been on a journey to date, we have some time to go. We have more opportunity to have a conversation about this project and the features of this project and your concerns. So with that, we will try to answer some of those questions tonight and Henaveva will walk us through that. Uh, so thank you very much. Excellent, thank you, Michelle, and to all of our presenters. Um, just a reminder, if you have a question that you would like us to address during our session, um, please um, flag one of our staff and, and submit that. Hopefully we'll get through all of them. It's about 6.43 right now at seven o'clock. We're gonna try to stay on time. We also have a webcast where we're repeating this information in Spanish. 
Um, so let's maximize the time that we have together. I think we can let the audience know if we need to be a little bit late on the Spanish webcast, we can. But let's get through as many of these questions as we can. Before we do that, I want to acknowledge um, a few of our elected offices who are with us here tonight who have been incredibly helpful in receiving and giving information on the program with the authority staff. From the City of Los Angeles Office of Council Member Nuri Martinez, we have Marco Sanchez with us tonight. Thank you for coming. Uh, from Council Member Monica Rodriguez's office, we have Susana Carmona and Humberto Quintana with us tonight. Um, from Assembly Member Lu Luz Rivas's office, we have Arturo Garcia Mendoza. From uh, the Sen office of Senator Portentino, Vickery Murphy. And from the office of Senator Kamala Harris, we have Brent Robinson. Thanks to all of you. You've been incredibly helpful in advising the authority as this program has been moving forward. Uh, again, I'd like to ask you to just please fill out um, the card. If you have a question, we'll be handling them that way. Um, the question topics for the benefit of our panel are uh, a few varied topics, seismic tunneling questions, water questions, noise, stations, cost um, and project benefits. I, you, for the benefit of time, and that's the whole reason of doing it on the card, I will be asking the question as it's presented and the, okay. If you wanna, We definitely want to receive that re comment. The question is about mitigation and w wanting to make sure that you're giving us that information. Please fill that out on the card or talk to us. You know, we are on a webcast, so we do need to get through this. So we'll be coming back again, and we, the staff definitely will be in the room to answer questions directly. So if you, if you will just allow me to get through the questions that have been submitted, and we'll definitely follow up to make sure your comments are received. Thank you. Um, for seismic and tunneling questions, there's, there's a few questions, so, so let me try to get through those. How complete are earthquake fault lines evaluations in Silmar? A lot of questions about Silmar. Many years ago, there was an explosion in a tunnel under construction in Silmar because it hit methane uh, and dislodged a recent quake. 17 people died, so we are nervous. So we can talk a little bit about the seismic and the tunneling approach. Yeah, they're on. Human, uh, if you could talk a little bit about the seismic uh, surveys. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes, we have evaluated the seismic condition along the alignments in general and uh, characterized those in a study that we have done. However, additional studies have to be done for specific locations. And with regards to the Selmar disaster, which happened in 1971, where 17 miners lost their lives. Actually, as a result of that incident, the state of California passed regulation, new regulation, you know, with respect to tunnels uh, and characterizing the ground conditions, what's called gassy ground condition. That explosion happened because of methane gas. So all of those issues will be evaluated during the design of the project. Uh, a little further on that, how far underground will the tunnels uh, go under Silmar? Um, under housing developments, an interest about that depth? I believe the depth ranges between 100 to maybe 400 feet, uh, different portions of the alignment in that area. And for those of you in, in the audience, we do have um, information on one of the flat screens that shows the tunnel depths. And for those of you online, all the information in the room will be on the website. Um, so you should look at that engineering um, PowerPoint, has more specific information about um, the depths of the tunnels. Um, in previous reports, the authority was quoted saying that refined SR-14 was chosen because it has less risk. What is it about um, our rock, soil, fault lines that makes this so? Does less risk mean no risk? Uh, Juan Carlos and Human and Rick, um, actually you could all probably talk to that, but Juan Carlos, why don't you talk about it from a project management standpoint? And since the interest is so heavily with the rock, um, Human, maybe you can talk a little bit as well. Yeah, so um, risk is an important um, element when we evaluate the projects and the alternatives. 
um, and that goes to um, the risk of, of something happening during construction in terms of um, complications, uh, things of that nature. Um, so we do evaluate that in general um, and, and try to assign um, that risk to the different options. So the refined SR14 does have the, less, the least amount of risk in terms of the tunneling um, under the mountains, which is an important part of, of the, the project. If you notice on the map, a good portion of it, a, you know, two-thirds of it or so is in, tun is in tunnel under the mountain. So that's an important part of our evaluation in looking at the risk. And it's um, not just the risk of the tunneling, but if, if something were to occur with the tunneling, um, how that would manifest it in other features in the forest. So that, was a, uh, that is an important part of, of that whole risk evaluation. Well, I was just, allow me to follow up. Yeah. So. Allow me to follow up. So what is it about our yeah. rock, soil, and fault lines that makes it risky? And does, does this less risk mean no risk? Uh, let me answer the last part first. Less risk doesn't mean no risk. There's nothing in life that has no risk. You can cross the street and there's a risk uh, crossing the street. But in terms of the rock conditions, the uh, rock, and as Juan Carlos mentioned, the portions of the alignment along SR-14 have shorter tunnels in the forest. The depths are less, so the, the pressure from the ground and the groundwater pressures are less, so it reduces the risk with respect to the design and construction of the tunnels. And, and the rock formations, they're, they're very different along portions of the alignment. At some locations, the, there are granitic rocks that are very strong and very hard. And, and that's another component for a certain portion that would reduces the risk for the tunnels. Let me uh, follow with this additional question relating to geotech. Have you studied how close former oil drilling sites in Somar and Pacoima come close to the refined SR-14? And if so, are these of concern to you? And if not, will you be doing any more geological studies? Yes, as I mentioned earlier, during the design of the project, additional geotechnical and geological investigation would need to be conducted to uh, verify those conditions and evaluate those. We've looked at the existing information that's available, but additional studies will be necessary to look at those conditions and to see exactly how close those oil wells and other conditions occur. Okay, I'm going to be moving to... Ex so, no, totally good point, because we definitely want to get to the cross range of questions. So the, any follow-up, I would highly recommend going to the, the speaker immediately following the meeting, and anyone online can also write in the, the same follow-up question so that we can cover more topics. But if there's more detail that you want, what's really helpful is to go to the map and, and talk to them directly with it there. Okay. Understood. Un understood. So, what? Let me ask the speakers if, if you'll allow me. Let's. We will definitely try to be as complete as possible in the answers, and let's continue to c cut across a few more points. Water use during construction. I understand. I understand. So, th so what I would like to do is meet you over at the map to understand exactly where you I live. I understand, and that's what and that's what we're here today to do. And we have the maps, and so we'd like to meet you to understand exactly where your cross seats are, exactly where your cross streets are, so that we can understand it. That rock, we have some rock back there some sample of the rock that we've drilled. It is the hardest, best rock to build a tunnel in. That's why that was risk. selected. So let's go uh, and continue on. You know, there's a few other questions about construction and the, impacts, and the construction impacts definitely deal with at the surface. So tunneling, a lot of the rock questions is underground. So to your point, um, let's talk about some stuff at the surface that affect people's potentially um, 
you know, where the train is. So please describe the construction process along San Fernando Road. How much material and for how long at the Boulevard Pit? Um, in addition to road closures for new grade crossings at Sheldon and Penrose, how will construction impact businesses and traffic along San Fernando Road through all of Sun Valley? So can you talk more about what people can expect at the surface? Let me take that, okay. So our, our alignment along uh, San Fernando Road from about uh, the spreading grounds down to Olinda, which is between Penrose and Sunland Boulevard. We're going to be on the east side of the existing Metrolink, uh, so also on the east, east of San Fernando Road. There really will be no impact, no physical impact to San Fernando Road, except perhaps at Sheldon. If we need to dip Sheldon to go underneath the railroads. San Fernando Road would have to dip down a little bit to stay connected to Sheldon at that point. That's just a localized grade separation project that we're looking at. Basically, the, the high-speed train would be at ground level, basically the same elevation as Metrolink. Uh, can, right, so we can, need to look at that. That's Grade separation projects are very complicated. We, mm -hmm. you know, they're difficult to construct when they're finished. The communities generally are very supportive of them. They make the, tra they make the area safer, quieter. But so this is something we need to work with the local community on. We can look at detouring traffic. Uh, detouring is already suggested. So can I ask Rick, can you uh, continue? And, and then I have another question about mitigating traffic actually on this very topic. Okay, so again, continuing south of Sheldon, we're again, we're basically at ground level next to the Metrolink. We would have two tracks for high speed rail and two tracks for Metrolink and Union Pacific to share. So it'd be a total of four tracks. Uh, it's ground level going underneath the I 5 freeway. And then once we get south of the freeway, we, we, the high speed tracks descend down into a trench and then into another tunnel. Uh, we have to be below ground as we go past the runways at the Burbank Airport and below ground when we get into the airport station itself. So uh, can you talk a little bit, or, or someone, about traffic? How does the authority plan on mitigating traffic caused by the construction activity? What will the construction impact be like on the community? Traffic? Yeah. So we, uh, we go out and we do uh, a full traffic analysis. We send people out to every intersection in the area and they sit there and they count how many cars are going through those intersections today. Then we predict based on where we are detouring or running construction traffic or think that we might be, we predict basically into the future how many more people might be running through those intersections at that time because the traffic patterns could change. People might be driving down to Burbank to a high-speed rail station. Uh, if the grade separation is built, then they don't have to stop as they cross the San Fernando Road. They actually get to flow over it um, very easily. So we factor in all of those things to determine if the project actually has an impact to the traffic. There are some features or some aspects of the project that don't have impacts. Where we're building a tunnel, that specific activity doesn't have a traffic impact. However, if people are driving to a construction site, right, to help build the tunnel, or if, uh, or something like that, then we analyze how many people we think are gonna be driving to that construction site. Then we recommend a series of things, whether it be adding an additional lane, adding a left turn pocket or a left turn signal, et cetera, we analyze and recommend the things that are needed to mitigate that traffic impact so that it is not more, there is no more traffic there under the conditions of the construction than there are today. And there's a whole suite of things that you can time the stoplights differently so you can run cars through these corridors at different, uh, different uh, intervals, all kinds of things and tools that the traffic engineers have in order to mitigate traffic. 
So it is a very extensive study based exactly on how many people are driving around in the community today and what is predicted with the project in the future. Thank you, Michelle. We would like to get through a few more questions here. Um, and those that we are not able to get to, I'm trying to cover all the topics. We will be sure to respond to you uh, following the meeting. At our last meeting, there was a bunch of questions we weren't able to get to in front, but we will be responding to them. For those of you online who may be joining us for our 7 o'clock Spanish presentation, we're going to take about 10 to 15 more minutes to continue with our English question and answer. So if you'll just allow us uh, a few more moments, si por favor tengan paciencia en line, um, porque vamos a tener un poco más uh, preguntas y respuestas aquí en inglés y luego vamos a hacer la presentación en español. Gracias. All right. For hazardous materials in geology. Can I talk more about Michelle? We're talking about the, the section of San Fernando Road. That question was asked two years ago of how this would impact this community. Because so, we have a high community, high community working Population, yes. Yes, so we, we understand that. It's been two years. Can you at least give us, give us an estimated time of how it's going to affect our community? If you haven't been able to give us the answer in two years, why don't you give it to us in another year? So, the infra, the, can you repeat just the point? Because allow us to um, kind of control the questions here because folks online and in the room, if you, excuse me. Ex Okay. It's Can I ask you to be brief, please, because I have folks waiting. Please go ahead, and we need to repeat the point. Please go ahead. Yes, we know. Yes, we know. Yes, and it will be accommodated by the project. I understand. Okay, so green space and open space for benefit of everyone else. Can you please wrap up your comment? I've been trying to get to the rest of the questions and people who are waiting. Those are excellent comments. They're excellent comments, and we want to make sure to receive them. Absolutely. We definitely want to hear the comments. However, I need to move to everyone else as well. If you can just wrap up this last comment, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those are excellent comments. Thank you very much. If I can proceed with a few more um, geology hazardous materials questions, because this is also something of concern I think was also implied there. You mentioned at the last meeting that contaminated materials will have to be transferred out. What is being used to contaminate the soils and or waters? So if you can talk about that, as well as will soil complexities in the Pacoima Wash area prevent tunneling? So a little bit more about the dirt and any contaminants. And thank you. That was a question from uh, our, one of our online viewers. Um, so the contamination that is in the soil that 
this project we encounter is already there. So the, the project is not introducing contaminations. It's going to encounter them as it digs through the soil, um, particularly near the Burbank Airport area because of the past uh, historical land uses there. So that's the soil when we talk about the soils that are contaminated need to be handled in a specific way and hauled off to appropriate facilities so it's uh, handled correctly. That's the type of soil we're talking about that needs to be uh, removed in that fashion. Thank you. So those are those are no no absolutely not. Can so you the, the, the soils question? need to be tested before we touch them, and determine what's actually in them and what levels. And at that point, then it's prescribed how those actually get handled. Whether you're in white suits with respirators or what the level of of uh, it needs to be handled with. Then it's put in trucks. The way it's put in trucks is then specifically handled, whether it's covered or not covered or contained in. 50 gallon drums, it's all prescribed based on the level of contamination of that soil. Then it's hauled away to the right facility that has the, 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 the cert, it's certified to be able to handle the kinds of contaminants that are in that soil. So it's very uh, specifically handled when we encounter soil that has contaminations already in it. Can I follow up? There's, there's a related What's question. That? Why just a Well, because uh, to put a station underground, so there's. So that's a valid comment. That's an absolutely valid comment. So let me just, let, me, let, let us, allow us to clarify, the project has not been decided upon. We are here with an update. So people's opinions about not doing the project or choosing a different alternative is absolutely a valid comment and something that we need to hear. For folks who are interested in understanding more about what it is that we're proposing is what we're trying to explain. So absolutely, no, that is fine, and we're hearing that, and we're marking it down. We're trying to get more public information out, including with the information that we have here. So if you'll allow us, definitely. Well, when you find that it's contaminated and your people are geared up for the contaminant, what do you do with the rest of the community? Is someone going to knock on my door and say, hey, Gwen, I brought you this suit to put on because we are now building up the soil in your community that's contaminated? As Scott mentioned, it, there's an entire process around anything that is. I understand. Absolutely. Yep. It is. And it is one, as the individual said, it is one of the complexities in this area. It's, it's a challenge, and this team is required to address that. Then that's a valid comment. We will definitely put that down. So understand it. If, what, one moment. One moment. You, let's, let's make sure, let's make sure that we get through our meeting respectfully and Everyone's comment is absolutely valid. So please, please allow this to go. Absolutely valid. Just a time check. It's 7.06. For those of you online, we will be taking another five to, to eight minutes of questions. Anything that we are not able to get to, we assure you we will want to have that conversation with you. We have these in writing. We will follow up. We will. Fair point. Fair point. Absolutely fair point. The lot of information we're trying to convey, we are absolutely are here through 7.30 to continue the conversation. So is there, how much, let's, excuse me, excuse me, we have a question regarding water, which is a very important topic. Excuse me, there's a very important topic that many folks are interested in. So Scott or um, Rick. I'm having a question about how much water is used to drill one mile of the project. So the drilling and the tunneling is required. How much water is lost and how much is captured for reuse? So can we talk about that? This is a big issue in the area. Um, I, I don't know that answer. Maybe we can, we can try to get exactly that number of gallons and all that. What I will say is the tunnel boring machine operation is fairly contained. Um, all, all of the water that's used um, through the tunnel boring machine, it comes back out, it gets recycled, it goes back in, comes back out, gets recycled. So it's, it's almost a closed system. So the water is reused over and over again and, and recycled within as they go through with the tunnel boring machine. It is a very, um, um, you, know, enclosed, you know, contained operation. So I don't know if if either of you guys know the, the exact number of gallons per mile. I don't, I don't know if I know that, but we, we can get that. No, the water for construction is not 
being extracted from the ground. So any water that be used would be from a municipal source. So a, there's an, a couple more questions, one on noise, one on business impacts. What is the noise impact on this section for the above ground section, 50 feet, half mile? If we don't know yet, when should we expect to know? So can you explain the noise Sure, impact? so there is a, um, if you're interested in noise and the amount of noise that train, these types of trains make at different speeds, there's an exhibit, a handout that has those uh, sound levels and how those relate to different other types of things you might um, experience, other freight trains, trucks, those kinds of things, uh, horn noise from the current trains. Um, so we, we don't have, as we said, we, we don't have all the, everything all done yet, but what we have been doing is we've been out in your community, we have been taking noise measurements of what the noise levels are now along the rail corridor at residences, churches, parks, anywhere we would consider a noise sensitive location. We then take the, the, the train um, schedule, the numbers of trains, the speeds that we'll be running, and we'll calculate the future noise level at those same locations. And so there are standards set both by the state and federal as to agencies as to how much noise the trains can create. And so wherever the trains create uh, exceed that standard, we then have to apply mitigations. And there's a number of things that we can do in those locations. There are um, skirts that can be put on the trains uh, to protect the wheels. The wheels rolling on the, on the rail is one of the more noisy pieces of this because these are electric trains, they're not uh, diesel engines. So the, um, that has a, a, does very well at reducing the noise from the trains. If that isn't enough, then we can build walls along the corridor, just like sound walls you see along the freeway, oftentimes are in areas where residences are very close to the train track. So um, our analysis is going through determining where those types of features need to be applied in communities where the train is at the surface. Um, in this area is a, of course very um, uh, sensitive and we're looking very closely at, at those noise levels and where those types of measures will be needed. Um, that information will be that the details about that and where exactly sound walls are recommended and will be in the draft. I think that's what I just did say. I did say that. So can you and that information will be in the draft one, environmental document that will be released to the public to review. So. And just to clarify, the, we are um, a year, more than a year away from the exact answers of the environmental document. On purpose, it, it, that's correct, and it is a, a significant program. If you'll allow us to finish, there is information that we want to provide. I understand. I understand. I understand. Definitely understand the frustration. We are on purpose here early to provide you information. So it's, this is, we, this is part of our job is to make sure that we communicate to the folks who we are affecting what is to be expected. Thank you. Understood. 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 Thank you. One, one moment. One moment. So listen, everyone. We very much appreciate and understand. If you'll allow us, we very much appreciate and understand these comments and the frustrations. The team, one moment, the team has been working quite a long time and having lots of conversations with people. This is part of that conversation. It's still, we still are not making a project decision today. There is a recommendation that you need to know is occurring and we will continue. We will continue to provide you information. So I, with that, I want to acknowledge that there's additional questions that we will respond to. Um, please continue following and asking your questions and comments with us. It is part of our job to make sure that we do a good job for you. 
So with that, I'd like to conclude this part of our presentation. The team will still be here to answer your questions directly, and we will be proceeding with our online Spanish presentation in just a moment. Thank you very much.